carbon fiber. Cyclists love it. It's light, strong, sleek, and aerodynamic, just like me. However, a lot of people ask us, does carbon fiber fatigue over time? How long does a carbon frame last? Does a carbon frame have a shelf life? Well, to answer these questions, I've spoken to a Formula One composites engineer and an Oxford University professor to find out more. In order to better understand the discussion, it's worth just refreshing what carbon fibre is. Being a composite, it combines an epoxy resin with carbon fibres. The resin is known as the matrix, while fibres are reinforcement. By combining two materials in this way, you get a superior composite material. Before we proceed, if you enjoy this kind of content and find it interesting, then you know the drill. You can support the channel by simply subscribing. Cheers. And I mean, I find this topic absolutely fascinating. And I just, we, well, we wanted to go into quite a bit of detail to give you some really useful information. We've chatted to these experts and listened to what they had to say. And the result is, well, a video that's quite long. But what we've done is we've split it up into chapters so that you can skip various points and skip to the bits that you're interested in down on the timeline below if that's what you'd like to do. But without further ado, I first spoke to Tom Batho, who is a senior materials engineer at McLaren F1. Hi Tom. Thanks for uh, thanks for agreeing to to talk to us about this about this topic. So I mean the first big question I've got to ask you is it's a broad one I know, but does carbon fiber fatigue over time? Yes it does. Uh, perhaps not in the traditional sense that people familiar with metal fatigue would associate. So it's it's more of a an accumulation of damage um, that becomes increasingly more progressive um, until ultimately you end up with a high enough damage content to affect the performance of the material itself. So what sort of what's causing that damage then? So it starts off with um, very small fractures, micro fractures in the matrix, the resin of the material. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with the, the term unidirectional material, you've got a unidirectional laminate with different orientations. Um, and so if it's loaded in at zero degrees in tension, then a 90 degree um, ply will start to fail because that's predominantly dominated by the matrix properties, the resin. So the resin is effectively acting in an unreinforced manner at that, at that point. Um, and small defects within the material will initiate small fractures. Um, and then with repeated loading, that will progress. Uh, and those, those fractures will join up and ultimately may form a, a delamination, which will then progress more and more until the, the stiffness and strength is compromised. You know, how does mechanical stress affect carbon fibers? So not just the load, but like, so on bikes, for example, there are parts of the frame with say engineered compliance that are designed to sort of flex slightly. Yep. Now, is that constant flexing, is that is that gonna cause damage longer term or where? It's most likely to, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a mechanical input that primarily causes this. If you've got a got a brand new bike uh, bike frame that's just come out of the factory, and you apply quite high loads to it repeatedly, then yeah, that's a fatigue mechanism, and that will initiate the damage that I was talking about earlier, and that is likely to progress to the point that it becomes significant. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about flexures, um, now I think specialized have them in their Roubaix frames, don't they? In the Zerts around those. Um, then, you know, I don't know what analysis they've done, but certainly where the strain, you know, the deformation is reasonably high, then that's likely to impart more damage into the laminar. Um, and these would be the areas that are going to be of most concern. So if you haven't engineered areas of high flexure, then it's likely to be the bit, the areas that naturally deflect more. So if you think you've massively over-engineered your frame and the whole thing is solid carbon fiber, the stresses are gonna be very low in the individual fibers and in the make, at the interfaces. Um, whereas if it's super racy, very small, uh, thin wall thicknesses, 
then the material is doing quite a lot of work a lot of the time and the deflections are likely to be greater, um, which is likely to impart more damage. I mean, obviously, you know, when you work in Formula One, um, I'm not an engineer, but I can appreciate that the stresses and the forces placed on carbon fibre components in a Formula One car are going to be much more severe than that yep. placed on, on, on a push bike. Um, so in that case, w when you're talking about the sort of typical fatigue of, of push bike carbon frames, what would you sort of expect in terms of lifespan and, and, and things like that and degradation? It's a, it's a very difficult one to comment directly on. Um, so you have obviously all the materials are, are different, they have different properties, um, but the design concepts are different as well. So you're absolutely right, you know, the loads that are going through our suspension members are colossal compared to what would go through a road bike carbon frame. Um, however, the section of the component is also a lot greater. So you know, we may well be working with ostensibly very similar materials uh, in terms of performance. Um, but because we're using so much more of it, the cross-sectional area is so much greater that means that the stress acting on that component is probably equivalent. Um, so that it's, it's difficult for me to say that um, a road bike frame would perform any better or any worse because they're, they're so different. You know, the, the approach, fundamentally it's, it's a similar approach, but the, the actual load cases that are likely to be subjected to uh, are completely different um, and the engineering and the design work that's gone into it takes that into account accordingly. Well, something else we hear as well, anecdotally, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but you're the you're the man to answer this question, is that the carbon fibre used in, say, a Formula One car or a fighter jet is not the same stuff as what you'd typically get in a bike. Is this, is this true? And if so, what makes it different? There is some truth in that, yes. Um, so the material that we use, I mean, we... We're the subjects of FIA regulation, so we, we can't use whatever we want because it, you know, costs go out, out the window at that point. Um, so it is limited, but we do use some pretty exotic um, materials and fibres in particular. Um, however, the very top end road bikes um, use the same fibres, for example, um, and the resin systems that they use, we have certainly considered um, we've got the added complication of service temperature, you know, the, the brakes, um, the exhaust, the engine, the gearbox, all generates quite a lot of heat and not the sort of heat that you like to see on a road bike unless you're doing something, something wrong probably. Um, so that's an added complication uh, which you don't have to worry about on a road bike. Um, there are also processing parameters that you need to worry about. But yeah, certainly the very top end road bikes have very similar. So I think. I think the is a Pinarello Dogma. I think had uh, yeah, T1100 great. had a yeah T1100 yeah. um, fibers that's used in Formula One. I think if you were to get, I don't know, I don't, don't want to name any particular manufacturers of push bikes, but some of the cheaper um, carbon fiber uh, push bike frames, yeah. Then, yeah, you'll be looking at a lower grade of carbon fiber. But equally, in a Formula One car. You don't need the highest strength in every application, so you can get away with a lower grade. Um, you know, T300, T700, these are all grades that are used um, to a certain extent on, on Formula One cars. Has resin technology sort of developed? And, and how, and if so, like how has it developed since the sort of early days of, of cars? Yes, yeah, so, so without doubt, it has progressed significantly. Um, the main the main thing we're talking about when it comes to resin is toughness. Um, and by toughness, we mean it's the opposite of a brittle material. So resins by their very nature, epoxy resins are naturally quite brittle. Uh, you don't have to bend them much before they shatter, snap without reinforcement. Um, so the material manufacturers add in toughening phases and toughening mechanisms. Um, and you know, the, these can be as, as simplistic as um, small rubber particles included within the matrix. Um, there's always a downside 
with adding these materials, it can reduce the thermal capability. Um, so you know, very tough resins can be difficult for us to use because of some of the service temperatures that we have to put up with. Um, but that's, that seemed to be one of the biggest advancements and certainly matrix toughness has come on a long way. So is there anything else that does affect the lifespan of a, of a composite, um, such as you know UV damage or, or chemical damage? And again, anecdotally, something I've heard is that they're less, like if you have a bare finish frame and it doesn't have a paint on it, it lasts not as long. Um, I mean, yeah, that's really there's, truth a lot truth in that. there's a lot of truth in that. Um, again, it's not something that particularly affects Formula One cars because as you've already mentioned, we don't actually use them that long. They're not outside for an awful lot of time. Uh, most of the time they're in bits in the garage somewhere um, or traveling around the world. Um, but certainly epoxies do suffer from UV degradation in particular. Um, and the, the, the sailing world are very familiar with this problem. Um, UV affects practically all polymers to a certain extent. Um, the most noticeable thing is it discolors, but with that discoloration is also an increase in the brittleness of the material. Um, its mechanical properties degrade. If you are to cover it with something, then it stands to reason that you know some of that UV isn't going to make it through to the uh, the epoxy underneath. So yeah, that's that's certainly true. Um, and in aviation circles, you know, if you're looking at light aircraft, often they're um, glass reinforced um, or, or carbon fiber reinforced epoxies, um, such as gliders. And because of their size, actually they're outside for quite a long time. Um, you know, they're not always stored indoors. That's, uh, well, that's, that's sort of food for thought because you know, bare carbon finishes are very popular on bikes right now. Um, so that is, that yes. is interesting. Um, I think like anecdotally, again, something that you've I've, I've heard and you may have heard as well, riders, sprinters, much more powerful than me, such as Mark Cavendish, <laughs> talking about frames becoming dead. So the yes. frame, you'll get a new bike at the start of the season and he'll race it and race it and race it and race it. And they cover a huge amount of miles and all the rest of it. But they say that the, the bikes die, they, the, the frame becomes starts to become a bit muted and dead. I mean, is there, is there any scientific or engineering basis um, yes, absolutely. Um, so what I was talking about earlier with the, um, the initiation of, of damage at a low level, that will propagate. And the higher the loads and the higher the number of cycles, the greater that damage accumulation will be. Um, and certainly if you're looking at someone like Mark Cavendish, um, then you know the power output that he's putting through that frame and it's reacted through the bars so it's not just through the pedals but the whole the whole frame is reacting that load torsionally through the bars um you know, he's putting an awful lot of load through that frame um and he's doing it again and again you know you and i might go out on a ride and we might sprint to beat our mates up the top of the hill we might do that once you know it's his job to sprint again and again and again so these these frames are taking a hell of a beating um, so I think, yeah, for the likes of Mark Cavendish and, and all the great sprinters around the world, um, I can see it being a real problem for them. It's, it's a real effect and it will probably be measurable. Whether it's something they can actively feel, that's another matter. Um, but when we're talking about aggregation of marginal gains, then yes, it wouldn't surprise me at all if you were to bench test uh, a bike that's done a year's worth underneath. Yeah. Cavendish against a brand new one of the same model, yeah. the stiffness is likely to be different. Before, um, that would be a fantastic thing to do, wouldn't it? It would be so fascinating. <laughs> you do it would be, yeah. Um, and we see that on on our components as well. You know, we, we, do, um, we do an initial test to make sure everything's okay. And then throughout the season, we'll do what we refer to as service returns, where we'll do a test and make sure that it can react the load, but also that the deflection is, is the same. Um, and you do start to see parts that have done quite a lot of miles and seen some very high loads in that lifetime. You start to see uh, an increase in deflection, um, and that's the sort of a telltale sign that there's there's damage in there. Um, we're, we're lucky that we also have NDT um, facilities at our disposal, so we will always NDT parts as well. Um, but the you know the early signs of of damage may not be detectable by ultrasonic 
um, non-destructive techniques. So I mean, the, uh, you know, the ultimate question here is, you know, does a carbon bike frame have a lifespan? Does it have a service life? Um, you know, based on based on what you know. I mean, you you've said that yes, carbon fiber does fatigue. And we've gone through a few of the things that cause that, but yeah, I mean, does does would you say a bike does have a a lifespan? So uh, perhaps unsatisfactorily, um, a little bit frustratingly, it depends. Um, it depends on how it's been stored. So from a UV perspective, you know, if it's been left out in your garden, um, or the bloke who you're buying it off from eBay has left it out in the garden for the last 15 years, yep, it's probably going to have suffered some UV degradation, especially if it's bare carbon. Um, also, if he's built like Chris Hoy, then, you know, and he's a bit of a cyclist, <laughs> then the chances are that the, the loads that that bike has been through are going to be quite significant. Um, there's always, you, know, you will have heard when carbon bikes first came out, the worry about um, impact damage and crash, crash damage. Um, it's, it's the hidden damage that you can't see with carbon that's, that's always the worry. Um, but that said, you know, although it, it is a real thing, fatigue does happen in carbon and, and it, it does depend on the loads, there must be millions of carbon fiber bike frames out there that are 15, 20 years old now, um, and they're not falling apart. So by and large, I think the cycling public um, are pretty safe on, on aging carbon fiber bikes. Um, it would be nice if there's a service that they can send to to get these things MDT checks before they separate with their hard earned cash. <laughs> I'm not aware of any, any yet that aren't too expensive. Um, but I don't think we've got too much to worry about. If you're looking for absolute performance um, and you're a, a very competitive cyclist at near the top of your game, then yeah, there may be some advantage. We all like to think we are. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, then there may be some advantage in you know refreshing your bike every few years. Um, but I think for most of us, it's not something we have to worry about significantly. Right. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. That's. Um... Yeah, really interesting to hear all those all those points. Thanks, thanks so much uh, for okay. sparing your time to discuss that with us, Tom. And, uh, it's it's nice to have some some interesting questions on carbon fibre. <laughs> that's good. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, it'd be good to chat to you again in the future at some point. I'm sure we could. Uh, yeah, by all means. Have some interesting questions about about carbon. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'll let you uh, get back to Formula One cars. Excellent. Cheers. Thanks, Ollie. <laughs> Cheers. Having spoken to Tom, I was keen to find out more, so I arranged a call to talk to Professor James Marrow from the University of Oxford. James is a professor of nuclear materials science and specialises in physical metallurgy, micromechanics and x-ray crystallography of engineering materials, mainly ceramic matrix composites and nuclear graphite. Well, short answer is yes, they will. Um, you know, all materials fatigue over time. Um, I, I think that the, the biggest, the, the thing which controls how quickly your fatigue will occur is the the, the, the strain that you're applying. You know, f fatigue is a, is a cyclic process. Um, and when we think about fatigue, we, we can either describe it in terms of the cycling of the, no, sorry, the, the, the cycling of the load, so the variation of load, which gives you the stress, or we can talk about it in terms of the cycling of the strain which you think of as the deflection. Um, and it's the, in composites, it's the cyclic deflection, which is really important. And the bigger the magnitude of that deflection, the more fatigue damage you're going to develop. And over time, you're going to cause degradation of the properties of your composite. So in, in the case of bike frames, something that, you know, sort of spoken about is, there are often designers of frames will engineer, they will make use of the fact that carbon fiber can be flexible in certain directions. And they will engineer what's almost like mechanical suspension, you know, compliance within a bike frame. So you've got a bit that's designed to flex under load. Yes. Um, to dampen it. And and is that an area where that's gonna is that an area that's likely to then cause strain and, and, and failure? Not not necessarily, because it, it in a sense, that that you know, that, that sti the stiffness that you're getting, you know, or, or the, um, depends on the the layup of the fibres and the orientation of the fibres with respect to the load. 
And it's achieving that um, deflection by the essentially well, the, the fibers are carrying all the load. The matrix just holds the whole thing together, but it's, it's the fibers are carrying the load. Um, and in fatigue, it, it is essentially the matrix which is failing and the interfaces between the fibers and the matrix which fails. Eventually the fibers do start to fail, but it's, 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 it's a damage process largely in the matrix. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult question to answer because you, you need to under, you need to calculate or think about what strains are occurring in the matrix and at the interface when the composite is is, a, is, a, is under that kind of loading. So, uh, instead, if it's properly designed, it should be fine. Yeah, and the the, the the tolerable strains will depend on the layer of the composite. Fatigue is a mechanic. It, it, it's essentially a mechanical process. Yeah, the, yes. there are environmental factors in there. But essentially, it's a mechanical process. So it's it's more the number of cycles that the material has experienced and the amplitude of those cycles, which are introducing mechanical damage. So I wouldn't really want to, in all fatigue problems, you wouldn't really want to talk about it as a time problem. It's the number of stress cycles or strain cycles that the material has received. So if, you're, if your bike is actually sitting, not being used, um, it's not going to degrade over time. Yeah, it, it's, it's only if it's got those, that mechanical loading it's going to cause the degradation. So in theory, if yeah. we had a, a bike that we didn't use, and yep. it was just left in a in a room, and it was thirty yep. years old. Yep. How? What would you have expect oh, well. to take the carbon fibre to be in? That's a, that's a more difficult one because that, that that's straying into. I'm, I'm not a polymer scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the long term stability of the the matrix when you start talking about decades, uh, I wouldn't want to comment on that. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a relatively inert environment, I would expect everything to be fine. I would, I would expect no significant degradation of properties. Essentially, the, the key thing is the mechanical damage. Yeah, that's, right. that's, it's, 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 it's the usage rather than time which dominates the, the behaviour. I would certainly. I think I mean, the, the two things which are going to affect the the material are UV and moisture. So UV radiation and moisture. Um, those affect the matrix. Yeah, they, they they will over time degrade the matrix, which I think UV is, is probably the most most significant factor because it you know it literally is interacting with the molecules of the of the of the epoxy matrix, um, and it's making the matrix a little bit stiffer. It's making it a little bit more brittle. Um, but then, because I said earlier, fatigue is a, is a mechanical process. It's about the, the interfaces also between the epoxy and the and the fiber. If you get um, moisture penetration into your composite over time that will also degrade the interface it causes swelling of the epoxy and both uv and moisture together will degrade the composite so if your composite is, is exposed to uv and moisture i would expect its properties to degrade over time I and mean, that's that's interesting it sort of opens up a can of worms yeah. firstly because bikes get cleaned a lot Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, do take care of top end road bikes and mountain bikes. They clean them all the time. Yeah. The other thing is there is obviously a, a trend for a lot of manufacturers to make bikes with a raw carbon finish mm -hmm. because aesthetically it's seen as good. Yeah. It's also a bit lighter. Um, but based on what you're saying, it it sounds like a, a, a paint finish that would help better protect against UV. Yeah, I again, mean, is the I, I'm not an expert on 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 the bikes, um, the composite. I mean, is it? I've not come across the raw finish. Is it literally a raw finish, or is it is it a transparent, clear finish on top of well, the tree? Well, often there matters. will be a transparent lacquer. Yeah. So, so, so the lacquer there is, is, is you can see the weave. Yeah, but the, the lacquer then it, it, the lacquer is essentially providing the the barrier, the moisture barrier. So if mm. the lacquer is 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 a, is a, a, a suitably chosen as a moisture barrier, you're going to avoid that problem of moisture penetration so long as that lacquer is not damaged. And of course, that lacquer is itself a polymeric material, which over time has the potential to degrade because of the exposure to moisture and the environment. So it's the lifetime of that lacquer which then protects the composite below it. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Just because just it's transparent, I wouldn't wait. I mean, um, it's transparent, it's not necessarily UV blocker, but it depends what, what it's made out of. But uh, Again, this is where you probably need to talk to um, a, a polymer chemist or a polymer polymer expert 
um, because there's a lot you can do with um, coatings and lacquers to, to block against UV. Because all polymeric materials uh, have this issue with moisture and UV, and there's a, there's a lot of work being done over the, over the decades to improve the lifetime of plastics. You know, modern plastics, modern polymers are much more tolerant to UV and moisture than the things uh, from several decades ago. I mean, looking at your expertise as well in terms of in terms of metals and mm -hmm. alloys and fatigue yeah. in old materials, obviously they are alternative materials that bike frames can be made yeah. out of. Yeah. How does the fatigue of, of those compare to carbon yeah. fiber composites? The, 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 the mechanism of fatigue is, is, is completely different. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're absolutely, absolutely different. Um, Metals are uh, metals are made out of essentially crystalline. They're, 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 they're completely crystalline, and the the thing that makes metals ductile, you know, that makes them tough, is the ability of those crystals to to deform. Um, by uh, it's, it's a mechanism that involves the, the the planes of atoms sliding over each other um, by something that's called a dislocation. It's, it's, it's fundamental to why metals are, are ductile and ceramics are not ductile. Is the is the ease of movement of those dislocations. But when you have a, a cyclic load applied to metal, those dislocations, this this thing that makes metals ductile, they, they basically shuttle backwards and forwards, and over millions of cycles sometimes thousands if the loads are high, that turns into a crack within the crystal grain. And then that crack propagates, and that's the classic fatigue failure that metals do. So you can do the same thing with a paper clip, take a paper clip, bend it backwards and forwards, it'll break, and you're literally doing it by sliding atoms over each other and doing this mechanism. Composites are different, yeah? Composites, you've got a polymeric matrix, so it's not crystalline. Um, and the fibers themselves are not fatiguing. The fibers only fail because the, the load on them becomes too high when they lose the support of the matrix and things like that. So, um, so the, the, the mechanisms are completely different. The only thing that's perhaps connecting them is that in a metal, the environment, moisture, can accelerate the fatigue process. Yeah. Uh, in the same way in your composite, moisture, because of its effect on the epoxy, and the effect on the interfaces could also accelerate the fatigue process. And fatigue in metals is a much more localized process. You know, uh, you'll have individual cracks which are slowly propagating. That's why usually when something breaks by metal fatigue, there's one crack. Yeah, there's not often many, many cracks because one crack starts and then dominates and leads to the bit falling off. In composites, the, the damage is a bit more distributed. Yeah, um, it's not a single crack. It's lots and lots of cracks. And that's why, for example, as a, as a composite, as it fatigues, you'll notice its stiffness decreases. Yeah, the, 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 those micro cracks and the, the many, many cracks which are developing are decreasing the elastic modulus or the stiffness of the composite that become yeah. more flexible. I mean, that that's that's lends weight to to one of the things that I was, was going to ask you about. Yeah. Anecdotally, you know, yeah. very powerful sprinters in cycling they they talk about their carbon frames becoming dead and yeah. and, and like muted they start off incredibly stiff and then yeah. they start to you don't want to say spungy because it's not that it's it's stiffness changes and it is it's, it's, if you do a fatigue testing on composites um one of the things that changes is the elastic modulus which is the, the, the stiffness so it, it's the if you think about um bending a beam of a composite, yeah. Um, if you apply a certain force, it'll deflect by a certain amount. Yeah? yeah. If the stiffness decreases for the same force, the deflection will get bigger. Yeah. So it'll, it'll deflect more, and, and that will affect the dynamic response of the bike. Uh, so that that that, that fatigue, you know, that, that will change the stiffness. And I think that's something you would feel as a cyclist. Yeah. Would you would, do you think you'd feel that in in a steel or or aluminium bike? as well um, to, to, to extent, yes, to, to, yeah to, to extent that if you've got a big enough because again the, the, if you've got a crack uh, you know, a yes. big enough crack in a metallic component will change the stiffness of the component because literally the, there's a crack in it and there's there's, there's less metal to take the load hmm. but in a metallic component by the time you've noticed that loss of stiffness you're just about to break the whole thing yeah right um, the fatigue at the micro scale in a metal component, you'd be hard put to detect the change in stiffness. 
that are going to composite because the damage is much more distributed to the whole material where the stresses are high or the strains are high or the fatigue damage is happening, then you would notice that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'd say much more noticeable than in the composite. That's, I mean, yeah, so it's almost a bit a bit nicer then to think of a carbon frame that's going to just become softer, yeah, kind of rather than a, a, an alloy frame which is just going to have a sheer fail yeah. um, and just and crack open. It, it's almost a bit more reassuring. Yes, um, it is. I mean, one of the terms is often used of composite materials is they have they, um, graceful failure. You know, right. Because you know, they, they are inherently more damage tolerant um, and so they, they do fail in a more graceful manner. But if you use high, you know, high strength steels, high strength aluminium alloys, um, I mean, if you give an engineer a stronger material, they'll put more stress on it, they'll put more load on it. Um, and that doesn't help you with fracture because fracture, the propagation of cracks in metallic components is all about the stress. So if you operate metallic components at higher stress, they fail in a more brittle manner because there's so much more energy stored in the structure when you're loading it. With, with the composites, they're more tolerant, they absorb more energy when they fail, and so the failure is less catastrophic. Are there any other factors that you should consider when working out you know how how what the lifespan of a carbon fiber component is going to be yeah, well, I mean, one thing in fact with, with all types of failure um it's it's the weakest component which is going to fail and failure is usually about the propagation of, of defects and if you've got defects introduced during your manufacture those are going to fail um and with with composites it's usually about the the cleanliness of the, the materials during manufacture, the, the consolidation during manufacture, it's, it, it's just defects. So, you know, we, I think with, with delamination failure, for example, this, this fracture between the plies, um, that is most often caused because of um, uh, lack of cleanliness or voids at the interface, yep. uh, which are themselves a stress concentrator. Um, and so those will fail earlier. So um, quality of manufacture is, is a big thing uh, in, in, in strength of composite materials yeah it's interesting it's, it's hard it's very hard for i think consumers to look at two carbon frames mm -hmm. from different manufacturers and go well this one has less voids or less you, defect you, you couldn't tell <laughs> you couldn't tell yeah you just couldn't tell ultimately my, my my question i'm trying to answer is you know does a carbon fiber bike frame have a, a sale by date or you know or, or a sort of service life on the expectation because i'm not a polymer scientist yeah um the key thing would be the aging over time of the epoxy even in a normal you know, sort of normal domestic environment your epoxy is going to age yeah because we, we don't live in a vacuum we don't live in inert gases we it will age over time how quickly that would be i couldn't say yeah um but a polymer Polymer chemists should be able to give some information on that. But, you know, the, the, you know, it is possible to measure the properties of the epoxy over time and the, the degradation over time is predictable. And so it would not surprise me if there was a, uh, a, a degradation in the properties of the matrix over time. But my position would be that the most significant thing would be the use. Um, you know, uh, if, it, if, if the bike has been used, and abused that is probably more important than the actual age yeah right well, i think i think the, the take-home message is don't buy a used bike off chris hoy because yeah uh, i think i think so yes unless he hasn't used it at all yeah but yeah <laughs> i think it, um it's, it's like all all you know you wouldn't buy a car off someone who drove it off road all the time you know it, it, they, they, they will be great they, they will be affected so uh, if you just can use it as a runabout town um then yeah. fine but if you're expecting high performance for an old bike uh i'll be careful right well thank you very much for your time it's been yeah, really interesting you know, talking to you and thanks for your insight i think i'd um i'd love to get your insight on on alloy frames at some point in in the future yeah, happy to chat about that yeah about that, i think that'd be uh, really interesting because there's, there's a lot of interest there and well the, the the most bikes in the world sold today are made from aluminium so yeah, yeah. there you go Big thanks to Professor James Marrow and Tom Batho from McLaren. And to answer the question, does your carbon bike have a shelf life? Well, nothing lasts forever. And unfortunately, 
neither will your bike. However, it's impossible to put an exact number on it as it will largely depend on how your bike is used and the environment it's used in. Overall though, the good news is that carbon fibre is much more likely to delaminate and fail as a result of impacts rather than fatigue created or built up through just normal expected use. Now, I hope you found this video interesting and informative. And by all means, let us know your questions and suggestions in the comment section down below of where you think we could go next with this topic, because I think it's absolutely fascinating. If you've enjoyed it, share it with your friends if you've got any, and um, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.